All right. Hey, everyone. You might be able to hear some piano in the background because it's Friday afternoon and my wife is doing piano lessons online through Zoom. I am teaching biochemistry online through Zoom. And so we left on a cliffhanger last week. We now have, um, we talked all about antibodies, but we left on a cliffhanger that we had this particular, this particular um, diagram that was shown that there are variants that have re resulted from mutations, and some of those variants appear to avoid being neutralized by antibodies. That means the antibodies are not binding the receptor binding domain, the RBD, of the spike protein. They've somehow, um, they've got mutations, and once the laws of evolution take place, the mutations will cause the virus that avoids antibodies to survive. And so this is kind of scary. This looks like uh, the antibodies are, you know, well, well, first of all, it looks like the viruses are just going to run away from our antibodies as soon as we make them. And I remember there being a lot of anxiety about this from last year. This is from September 2020. And there was um, a study came out that said pretty much the exact opposite of what the headlines made it say. The headline said this, COVID-19 antibodies may fade in as little as two months, study says. St CDC says people who recover from COVID-19 are protected up to three months. Well, that was September 2020. That was before vaccines, that was before any of this. We just knew um, natural immunity was what we were looking at here. And we were looking at this, and you read these headlines, and you're a little bit, little bit worried. But these headlines are badly worded. We only had two to three months of data at this point. What these were saying is that the antibodies still appeared strong, as far back as we could look in September. What I would say is this definitely should be edited as a headline to read for at least three months, because that's what it means. In fact, there were indications that the response was still strong after three months. So for most people, the antibody response would still be strong after a number more months. Now we're farther out and we can actually see more of that. And so, um, just, I was, just want to point out that this kind of behavior, some antibody fading is completely normal. But remember, there are other coronaviruses. There are common cold coronaviruses that are called endemic. One of those is the 229E coronavirus. And uh, that has been studied in the lab. And they've seen that antibodies fade, you know, by 12 weeks after inoculation, the antibodies start to go down. That makes sense because you don't have the virus in your body, at least not detected by the immune system anymore. And so why should the body make all these antibodies when there's no reason to have them around? The body doesn't waste energy like that, and it takes energy to make antibodies. So antibody fading is normal. And the most important thing to realize, antibodies will fade naturally over time. There are other components of the immune system that help you remember. Antibodies are like short-term memory. It's like cramming for a test, and then it fades. But hopefully there's some long-term memory that got into your brain beyond the short-term that you crammed for the test. And that's my goal as a teacher. That's your immune system's goal as an immune, uh, as an immune system. Okay? So there are even things called B memory cells that, like they say, it helps you to remember. So this kind of fading is what we saw with the SARS-2 coronavirus, and it's exactly what we've seen with the common cold coronaviruses before. So that was this was at the time, this is August 2020, three months post-infection, we could look and we could find antibodies, memory B cells, and memory T cells, which we haven't talked about that much yet, but that's going to be the next part when we get to it. Right here, this is the introduction to all the things beyond antibodies and B cells that are uh, impo important to the immune system. And so this is a, a study that recently came out, just a, a 21, 21 study that looks, instead of after regular infection, it looks post-vaccination. So instead of three months post-infection, we have a week post-vaccination. And they see the same three things. Vaccination is a really good proxy for actual natural infection and immunity. So you see antibodies, memory B cells, and memory T cells. Now this one was just looking relative to vaccination, but they really had four good time points that they looked at. They looked at before you got the vaccine, two weeks after the first dose, the day of the second dose, and one week following the second dose. 
So because the two doses are a couple weeks apart, that means that you have at least a month that your immune system has been learning. But it's just for the spike protein often. You know, it's just for one part of the virus. But all of our evidence says that this one part of the virus is the important part to go after. And it will prevent the virus from even infecting you and even being able to be transmitted. We have evidence for all these things right now. These vaccines are great. And so I've been a little bit frustrated by the tendency of we don't know because we can't know if we're at three months out from the infection. We can't know whether there will be infection four months out. This is a logical impossibility. But we can see that there's still strong immunity three months out. You know, so it's those kind of headlines that sort of drive me crazy, honestly. So, um, and one of the other important things is most of the mRNA vaccines have two dose regimens that they're given to the person with. If you think about it, if you've already had natural immunity to the virus, you probably only need one dose. And in fact, this has been brought out and this has been proven in the lab by more than a dozen studies, including this particular study right here. Unfortunately, that has not cut off with our policy. Our policy seems to be to um, give two doses to everyone when there are some studies that say it doesn't really make a difference if you've already had COVID, it sort of counts as your first dose. So I just want to encourage people who are making policy to look at the science and be able to incorporate things like this into your policies. One of the great things about papers like this is that the first author, Rishi Goel, has talked about it in a tweet storm sort of on Twitter. And it had this about it. Uh, he talked about side effects. What about side effects? And uh, so they even measured how do side effects correlate with the antibodies you get? Because sometimes you give someone the vaccine and they don't make as many antibodies as other people. And so this was a worrisome thing. What about these people that don't seem to have as many antibodies in their serum when you test them a couple of weeks later? Are they somehow unprotected? The answer is no. And the other part of the answer is, if you have side effects, then the side effects are one of the signs that they correlate pretty well with high levels of antibody in your serum. So if you get your first or second dose and you're laid up by it, you can take uh, comfort in the fact that, like this scientist says, no pain, no gain. The systemic symptoms, fever and chills, go with having a higher antibody level. But on the other hand, that higher antibody level is not crucial to protecting yourself against future infections. What is crucial is, like he says right here, the generation of memory cells. And even without side effects, those who don't have side effects still generate great memory cells. So the side effects graph is the one on the left, the memory cells is the one on the right, and the one thing you'll see about the memory cells, the two levels are about the same for the memory cells. That means that even if you didn't generate a lot of antibodies in response to a dose of the vaccine, well, that might give you just a little bit of extra protection at the time of, but the really important thing is you're still making a strong memory response. So chills and fever, you're making antibodies, but it doesn't really matter as much as the memory cells. So it's really cool to be able to uh, go around Twitter. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Twitter, but this is one of the things I love about it, getting the scientists to tell me in real language what these data mean. And so the reason why I'm talking about this is very uh, much relevant today. Yesterday at noon, I went down to the YMCA and they had a pop-up vaccination clinic, and I was able to get my second dose of Moderna. And everybody reacts to these a little differently, and I want to tell you what my story was. Actually, everything was fine. I even, you know, like went to sleep at a normal hour. I got stuff done. I was like, I'm going to get my um, structural immunology lecture really done. Uh, you know, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning and do my structural immunology lecture, you know. Um, well, everything was fine until the Tylenol wore off at 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. all of a sudden, I was feeling feverish and chills. Not severe. You know, I could tell that I wasn't really sick, but I was also a weird combination of being tired in one way, but being wide awake in another way. So that kept me up. I took some more Tylenol, but I was still awake by that point. And then I um, went back to sleep at 6 a.m. And I pretty much slept until noon. And then I got up and I noticed that I had a, like a headache. And I remembered something that I'd forgotten before. A couple weeks after my first dose, I had one day where I had this episode where this headache came out of the blue. 
and I was like, I didn't even think that it could be the vaccine, but it was, I think, because it felt just like this. So what do I do? I had some Krispy Kreme donuts downstairs. I rewarded myself with Krispy Kreme strawberry cream filled donuts, which by the way are really good if you like strawberry milkshakes. Um, so I, I had one more donut at the bottom and uh, at the bottom of the stairs and thankfully my kids had not eaten it. And I went downstairs and I made sure that I ate a lot of sugar right away. And so I want you to think about why did I do that? You know, I'm generating cells, I'm burning energy. I'm building lots of structures. What helps you build structures better than sugars and fats? And sugars are the fast way to build uh, uh, to build structures. I actually, I don't know for sure if it was the donut, but I think it's a pretty good doctor's prescription to say, hey, um, I have a headache, so I'm going to eat a strawberry donut. Okay. A lot of sugar seemed to help, and that was based on biochemical reasoning. Okay, so I already knew that uh, the side effects were a sign that this was working. And in fact, we can even narrow it down to what part of the immune cell is working. This is for uh, reacting strongly to a flu shot. Uh, but they traced reacting strongly to a flu shot to transitional B cells. Different than memory B cells, different than plasma cells, different than all these other ones. We have all these different kinds of immune cells that I didn't have time to mention yet. And I'm not even going to be able to go too far beyond what they actually are. But um, the transitional B cells are what's overreacting when people feel bad with the flu shot. And I wonder if there's going to be a study in a couple of years where they look at people who feel like I felt like this morning and they, um, they can trace that to the transitional B cells as well. Maybe they're also the ones that make all those high levels of plasma antibodies that we have. We'll see. So I want to return to the history by Siddhartha Mukherjee about COVID-19 and viruses, virology. And at the end of that, he interviews one of my favorite scientists, uh, Akiko Iwasaki. And she uh, was is one of the um, best people to listen to if you want to know communication about cutting edge, what's going on with COVID. She's doing a study right now, for example, about how long COVID interacts with the vaccine. There's some possible good outcomes there. But here she's studied what causes COVID-19 to be so bad and the people where it's so bad. And what she says is, Iwasaki says there's a fork in the road to immunity. If you mount a robust innate immune response during the early phase of infection, you control the virus, have mild disease. But if you don't have that robust innate immune response, you have uncontrolled virus replication and then the virus gets ahead of your immune system. You start to get misfiring and you start to get inflammation which is as bad as it sounds. Inflammation is like a flame going off in your immune system in some ways. So this is a case of dysregulation and it involves a branch of the immune system we have not talked about very much yet, the innate immune system. So um, this, the, this initial fork in the road involves an initial branch of the immune system. And so even beyond B cells and T cells, which are part of the adaptive sort of evolving part of the immune system, there is this innate automatic part that acts a lot faster because it doesn't have to learn. You know, it doesn't have to study the virus or the protein that you give it. So for example, COVID-19 has a cytokine, a cytokine storm associated with it. And cytokines have, uh, um, there's a lot of different ones of them, but sometimes one of them predominates in a certain disease. And with COVID-19, there's an IL-6 cytokine, interleukin-6, that's associated with fever in general. Well, that makes sense. People with COVID-19 are burning up with fever. One of the things that goes haywire is that they produce too much IL-6. This could even lead to a therapy where you actually take their blood and you apply antibodies to it that will bind the IL-6 and pull it out of the blood. Would that be enough to turn down the progression, the misfiring of the disease. So it's important to say the immune system is really complex and the immune system even intersects with some areas that might surprise you like cancer or um, you know cell uh, organ grafts, you know, things like that. And so you have all these different things that can happen with the immune system. And so you want to have a normal response to, to different things, but you don't want to have, um, you want to have a normal response to the right things, you want to have a deficient response to the right things. 
For example, if an infectious agent gets into you, you want a normal response. If you have a deficient response, you have recurrent infection. If an innocuous substance gets into you and you have that same normal response, well then you have a bad red square, an allergy. You want to have a deficient response to an innocuous substance. So how does the immune system learn? It's a whole cell regulatory cascade and interleukins and in cells talking to cells. When you have a cell organ grafted, a normal immune response to a grafted organ could cause rejection of the organ. So you actually want to put that person on immunosuppressants. You want to tolerate your own organs. And sometimes you can have something going on. Somehow your immune system has a definition of what is me? What is myself? What do my organs look like? And if you don't, ha if you have something going wrong with that, then you have an autoimmune disease. You might know someone who has some form of autoimmune disease where their body is attacking itself. It's recognizing itself as foreign and trying to reject it. Now realize that the immune system can actually uh, reject things that look a lot like yourself if you have a cell that becomes a tumor cell. It looks a lot like a regular cell, but there can be small differences in it. And so you can have the immune system acting as tumor immunity and the immune system attacking tumors. That's why I did work in a structural immunology lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, because cancer is involved with immunity. So there's, uh, in all these things, it must strike a balance between not reacting to me not reacting to stuff that won't hurt me, but instead reacting to the things that will hurt me, whether it's cancer or an infectious agent. And realize you can have sort of four quadrants you can think about. The immune system is supposed to interact with the outside world and maintain the body's integrity. If you have too much of it reacting against your body, you have an autoimmune disease and you have tissue damage. Uh, if you have too much interaction with the outside world, say that the, you have the misfiring in SARS-CoV-2 infection, then you have an inflammation which also causes tissue damage and, for example, damage to the lungs. So realize that you can actually look at this as a, a balance. You've got to be in the middle of having too much response to the, um, too much response versus not enough response. And you've got to find out what things you're supposed to respond to. And we don't really know all the details of how the immune system makes these des decisions. But in some disease cases, we have gotten it down to a molecular component. And so uh, just remember that the way the immune system talks to itself is by secreting proteins that float through the blood and they bind to other cells. And these proteins are uh, interleukins and interferons are the two main forms of these proteins. And so for example, you can have different types of responses that involve different numbers of interleukins or interferons. Here's some example like a helminth is a worm. A helminth causes a type 2 response, which means that you have IL-33 being produced. And you can have the different things going on. If, if you're healthy, most of your responses are right in the middle. They're balanced. But if you have autoimmunity, let's say that you have a type 3 response that's going haywire. It's reacting to your body because it thinks that your body is a worm, is a helminth. And that would be the case in the second bar graph on the bottom there. So this is the most important graph that we're going to talk about because this talks about multiple different branches of the immune system. Like Iwasaki was talking about, you have the production of interleukins and interferons that happens very early with the green curve. And this is a virus infection going on for a week and it shows you what happens with the immune system. You have some innate signaling, which is interferons and interleukins, that happens automatically. They have some things that are called pattern recognition receptors, and they represent general viral structures. Of course, the problem with that is all the virus has to do is find the right way to mutate it so that the structure changes, and then the virus is able to evade it. Uh, there are other parts of the innate immune system, such as natural killer cells, NK cells, and that was the focus of my postdoctoral work. Those also come online in just a couple days after the virus infection. And then you have the red line, which is T cells. T cells take a while to get going. They take seven to 10 days later to have the real adaptive response that the T cells will come about to. Um, B cells, if there are some sitting around that are already useful, they can react really fast, but a lot of B cells take a long time to react because they have to shuffle their genes. They've got to figure out which antibodies they need to make. 
The good news is this graph actually extends beyond this. The, the normal T and B cell response is within like a week or two. But uh, months or years later, even decades later, you can be infected with the same thing and your immune system will recognize it. And so you, uh, we found out that that comes from special kinds of cells called memory cells. And there are B cells and T cells of this type as well. So if you look at a general kind of immune system, you can look at it at different levels of resolution. This is one really high resolution, or I guess it's low resolution because you only have three branches here, okay? But you have the, you, know, you have macrophages, which we talked about with the, these are sort of innate, although they have functions in the other branches as well. You have the B cells and you have the T cells. We've talked about those before. Even within the T cells, you have two different kinds. You have cytotoxic, which if you look, take that apart, cell toxic, so it's killer T cells. And then you have other T cells that don't kill, they don't have the killing chemicals in them. They are helper T cells that take part in these complex signaling pathways. And notice also at the very bottom, helper T cells involve the signals that help the B cells to proliferate. So to make the antibodies, you've got to get help from the T cells. This is all intertwined and it's very messy, you know, and sometimes it goes wrong and you have an autoimmune disease. Remember that all of these cells come from bone marrow cells. There are stem cells in the bone marrow that can become on the one hand a red blood cell or it can become any of these different kinds of white blood cells. For example, if you look on the left, it can take the path to become a B cell or a T cell. If you look in the middle, it can take a path and it can become a macrophage. And if you look all the way on the right, then you can become an erythroblast, which is a, an erythrocyte, I should say, which is what a red blood cell is. So you have these issues. So these are pictures of, and we call it, if we don't know what it is, we call it lymphocyte. I think lymphocyte, like common lymphoid progenitor, that is a lymphocyte, a cell that uses the lymph system and is part of the lymph immune system. Um, and those become, those grow up and those, those become effector B cells, which are plasma cells, which we've mentioned before, or effector T cells, which are the sort of equivalent. They're activated, okay? So the, all this system is tied together with your overall health. And there, there's a reason, it goes back to the reason why I went down and ate a donut, okay? Um, a, my friend in a Florida hospital noticed that metabolism has a link to COVID-19 complications. This was last summer, and this is something he posted. Um, he was in one of the largest hospitals in Central Florida, and he saw a lot of COVID patients then. And so it was really nice to know someone who was actually there. So I didn't have to go from a secondary resource. I could hear from him how the hospital was being stressed at the time. And he said, for some reason, there's a link between insulin resistance and overactive immune response to COVID-19, which dramatically worsens the outcome for patients. So diabetes, which involves metabolism. Obesity is a well-known COVID risk factor. Smoking also causes complications. By the way, if you heard the headline that smoking protects, that was based on a flawed study. Big surprise. Okay. But um, so how could something like sugar metabolism, diabetes, be involved with something like the immune system? And I just want to say that your body is full of wheels within wheels. It has signaling cycles that are interacting with metabolic cycles. Molecules are being constantly made and destroyed. And it's a dynamic balance. You may have heard of homeostasis, which is the state of a living thing. Stuff comes in, stuff goes out for the living thing, but the living thing itself appears to stay the same, homeostasis. And yet you know everything's changing on the atomic level. So these kind of systems are what the immune system staying in balance is part of the overall homeostasis of the organism. So when you have the cycle fall out of balance, you end up with, for example, too much IL-6 when it comes to COVID. Uh, so if you have a problem with sugar cycles, you have a problem with immune balance, and those can actually be related. If you have too much sugar in the blood, higher blood glucose, glucose itself has an aldehyde in it. It's a reactive molecule. And so it actually will produce different molecules. It'll actually react with some of your hemoglobin, and it will produce too much of the different sugar molecules in your body for example, you'll have too much UDP glucnac sugar. And that means there's too much sugar on an IRF5 signaling protein, which results in too many cytokines being made. This is an exact mechanism about how physically having too much sugar in the body, in the bloodstream, 
will cause a protein to be too much sugar uh, glycosylated is the word for it that we use in biochemistry and they've char uh, they've tracked that down to making too many cytokines maybe there's a similar mechanism with covid-19 where too much sugar in the bloodstream will cause a similar kind of signaling imbalance that might lead to the disconnect and misfiring that we see in covid in severe cases so the main thing is i'm re recording this for a class of biochemistry students who've been through a lot of metabolism and I just want to remind you metabolism is based on reciprocal and contradictory cycles there are molecules being made and broken down and there's even glycolysis which looks like a straight line cycle is really part of much bigger cycles in the body for glucose going back and forth getting made and broken down immunity is also cyclical it involves cycles of cells and I just want you to have that idea in your mind. We don't have to talk about exactly what the cycles are, but the fact that life involves cycles and not concrete little things sitting around, it involves dynamic proteins and cells interacting in cycles that break down constantly and generate constantly. That's very different than something like a bridge that just sits there and something like a machine in the literal sense, a, a lever or things like that those are mechanical your body is not mechanical it's much messier and sometimes these cycles can go haywire but uh, more often than not they actually work really well so for example um, metabolism is involved with immunity when T cells become memory cells they end up with different metabolism you see down here at the bottom naive T cells have a run on catabolic metabolism Effector T cells run on anabolic metabolism, which means that they are building, not breaking down. And then memory T cells switch back to catabolic metabolism. There's a whole field of immunometabolism that we can talk about here. And I just want to touch on this from my bio biochemists. Here's a really cool paper about immunometabolism. And the main thing I want to show you is all the stuff that you learned in Biochem 2 comes into play with the immune system here. For example, these are different uh, immune cells, and it shows how they emphasize different parts of the metabolic cycles. For example, aerobic glycolysis is going to support building things, anabolism, biosynthesis. And here's uh, aerobic glycolysis, and you see the bolded arrows right here are signs that this cell is building things. And these are specific uh, biochemical interactions that are involved with anabolism, okay? And so if you look back and forth with all these different types of T cells and macrophages and neutrophils, you can see that there are differences. There are some that are primarily anaerobic, some that are primarily aerobic. And the aerobic ones need more energy. And so cells that build up, they emphasize the citric acid cycle, they take in a lot of glucose and uh, they, they take in a lot of, um, the, you can see the glucose in the blue cells uh, and there's all sorts of compli complicated things, so I'm not going to get myself in trouble. I'm going to let you look at the figure if you want to know the details. But the main thing is cells will run different kinds of metabolisms if they are playing a different role in immunity. And so T cells even have a bunch of different uh, kinds that they can become. Once they're activated, they can become, here they have three different kinds of T helper cells that have increased their glycolysis. Uh, then the T reg cells, which are like the ones that are freaking out possibly after you get a flu shot, those ones have increased oxidative phosphorylation, not increased glycolysis. And so you can actually, once you know biochemistry, you can actually understand immunology at a new level. Try to understand why these cells have these pathways upregulated and not the others. So that's pretty much what I want to talk, want to talk about in this part. I have to tie this over to the themes of, I'm really fascinated by evolution and chemistry. And one of the things about evolution and chemistry is that oxygen is very special. For example, right here, you have oxygen can easily react and form this superoxide molecule, which is super reactive. Oxygen is very reactive. It's one of the reasons why you need it to live. You breathe it and you burn it with sugar and breathe it out as CO2. And that's really crucial for an advanced life form, multicellular, with different organs like we have. So um, the thing about this is that there is a necessary trade-off. You're basically handling a reactive chemical all the time in your cells, and it's going to get unbalanced from time to time. 
Occasionally you'll get an oxygen with too many electrons and it'll become a superoxide uh, anion like you have on the right side of the, of the slide here. So especially in places that use more oxygen, like the brain, which is one of the highest energy organs in your body, the highest, then you're going to have more reactive oxygen species, which means you need to protect against it. Now oxygen reacts with things, including if it gets to your DNA, it will react with it. And if it reacts with your DNA, if you break the DNA, you're very likely to end up with cancer, just because there's so many proteins involved with cell growth. So this means that you need oxygen to grow, but the oxygen also gives you cancer. So um, remember that the immune system actually uses oxygen, it uses peroxides, and it makes these reactive oxygen species, and it can actually go after cancer. What if, as cells learned to use oxygen, one of their defenses against the trade-offs of oxygen was to develop cells that would go around and kill cancer cells, kill cells that they could recognize as tumor cells. And then that evolved into becoming a um, cell that would kill um, non-tumor cells, you know, like bacteria that would activate those cells. And then you have an immune system. Oxygen could be central to the development of the immune system, and we know it's central to how the immune system runs. So the, the thing about this is that um, you even have a social relevance here. The cytokine storm where you're producing too much IL-6, the cycle has gone out of whack and it's turning, the wheel is turning faster and faster. And it's a little bit like when an inflammatory post goes viral, you know, it's getting passed on by too many people. And I can tell you there are certain voices online that I do not trust at all anymore. And we can have a conversation about who those voices are because we need to call them out when they are more after the inflammatory post, which will be like an inflammatory immune reaction that will destroy your body, social body. So it's, the fear can spread just like the misfiring of the immune system can spread. And so one of the main things that this is from a year ago, you know, and I was tired of people drawing conclusions from a single day of a spike. There would be headlines about that. But you've got to look at seven day average data because a lot of stuff goes on when you're collecting data. So there, I just took inspiration from the fact that there are peacekeeping cells, these regulatory T cells, that are supposed to calm down the cytokine storm. And so I, I think about that when you're online, it takes effort, it takes energy to be a peacekeeper, to be a peacemaker. But it's part of theology, and I'm going to get into a little bit of theology here at the end of this particular part. 1 Corinthians 12 takes the metaphor of the church as the body, and it's really, uh, it really fits with the immune system because it's the body defining itself socially as the church and the spirit defining the body and uh, the spirit's continuing action in the church. But the immune cells of the church will attack itself, right? Immune cells will attack themselves, and you have an autoimmune disease. When uh, we, as followers of Jesus, attack each other rather than looking to Jesus, then you have the equivalent of a theological cytokine storm. So the important thing is, this is a messy process, uh, but we trust as Christians, Christians trust that God has organized the members of the body, placing each one where it should be. And that says something, I mean, what does this mean? Um, but there is some organization to this. God has put you someplace for a reason. And if you're supposed to be inflammatory in the right way, sometimes there's a call for that. This is time to be a cytotoxic T cell. But there's also a time to calm things down. And it takes, it's not like you can follow a strict mechanical rule Rather, you're responding through a cycle of information and constantly testing every thought, you know, breaking down and building up. So the idea of myself and my immune system as a messy ecosystem of contradictory impulses rather than some kind of mechanical robot seems to be closer to the picture of what life really is. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, for example, talked about polar logic this way. Um, one of the reasons for this is it looks like a system like this will have fewer blue screens of death. Like if there's always a system, part of the system failing, then um, if part of the system fails, the whole system doesn't blow up. Uh, and also this is one of the reasons why antibodies are designed through evolution, through a messy, cyclical, uh, at 
parts of it random process, but it works and it protects us. So I want to quote a couple of people that just uh, I like to think about. I like to think about Samuel Taylor Coleridge and his polar logic where you have contradictory cycles sort of going at each other. Um, Terence Deacon argues that life has its own logic. If you want to know what I mean by life's messy logic, you would do well to read this book, Incomplete Nature. Um, he talks about how metabolism and immune response are parts of this common dynamical logic. And it's messy and it costs a lot of energy. Which is why I went downstairs and ate a donut. Because I knew my body needed energy. And then lo and behold, my headache went away. I was feeding my glycolysis. I was feeding my aerobic respiration. Okay, All four of these things, metabolism, development, repair, and immunity, are biochemical definitions of the self. And so Deacon actually talks about the self philosophically, but also the self as a body. Very interesting. There's one last thing I want to leave, especially speaking to the Christians out there. Uh, this is uh, from a talk, Roseanne Sension, um, who's a computer scientist, if I remember correctly. Uh, but she was talking about, uh, you know, we seem to, if we have too mechanical of a view of the world, then there's no reason for you to pray. You know, God isn't mechanical, though. The world isn't closed and mechanical either. If we present the world as sterilized and we present that world as like these propositions you have to believe in to be a Christian, as opposed to being part of the messy real life of real people, then we're taking our church away from where miracles can occur. And so miracles can occur and prayer is worth it in a messy, open, dynamical, changing system that we don't understand the whole thing. But we trust that it is good like God said in Genesis 1. So, basically, if prayer has become generic rather than an actual expectation that God could step in, then something's uh, wrong with the whole system. Something's wrong with our theological system. The theological system needs to be open to God's presence and power. And so I want to say, I had this for myself to remind myself to pray because we were as very scary part of the coronavirus epidemic at, a year ago. We didn't know what was going to happen, or, and I thought it would be another six months at least until we have a vaccine. On the other hand, today, I'm sitting here with the second dose of a vaccine in my, in my arm. I'm already 80% protected, and in a couple weeks, I'm going to be 95% protected against coronavirus. That's really amazing. And so for this messy process, this whole year has been really messy, kind of a dumpster fire, right? Kind of inflammation. But I want to say the... Um, it's a misunderstanding of the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of theology of how God's presence works and expecting things to be in nice little categories rather than dynamical, messy cycles that we're trying to keep in balance. Okay, so um, that ends up part four. That last little bit was sort of part not of the class, um, but I went. Uh, we'll move on to talk more about T-cells in just a little while.